Welcome to Reign of Grace. This program is brought to you by Reign of Grace Media Ministries, an outreach ministry of Eager Avenue Grace Church in Albany, Georgia. It is our pleasure and privilege to present to you the gospel message of the sovereign grace and glory of God in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that today's program will be a blessing to you. Thank you for listening, and now for today's program. Welcome to our program today. I'm glad you could join us for a study in the Word of God. That's what we do on this program. And today I'll be preaching from the Old Testament in a little book called Ecclesiastes. Now, you may not have heard much preaching from this book, Ecclesiastes, but I'm going to go to the last chapter of Ecclesiastes. The last, basically, my text is the last two verses. So it's Ecclesiastes 12 and verses 13 through 14. Now, it is generally accepted by Bible scholars that the human instrument that the Lord used to write the book of Ecclesiastes was King Solomon, the wise man, the son of David. And that's probably true, but it doesn't matter. This is the Word of God. And so we shouldn't get hung up and divide over issues of the human writers. Uh, sometimes it gives us a little insight into uh, what's being said. But we need to understand that the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is the Word of God. And so what I want to talk to you about today from Ecclesiastes chapter 12 is this subject, the conclusion of the matter. The conclusion of the matter. And that's where Solomon, as he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, concluded the whole book with these two verses, verse 13. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. And then he says, fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So let us hear the conclusion. The conclusion of the matter, or as Solomon wrote, the whole matter. Now the book of Ecclesiastes is a book about life. Life on this earth. And I've often heard people say that the theme of Ecclesiastes is the, ter is the phrase, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. And the word vanity, as you know, means worthless. Well, back up in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 8, Solomon repeats that. He, he repeats it throughout Ecclesiastes, but listen to what it says in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 8. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. Now Solomon is writing to the congregation of Israel who were typical of the true people of God. In fact, the, book of, the word Ecclesiastes, uh, you may have heard the term ecclesia, which refers to the church or a gathering. That's what it is. It means a congregation or a gathering. And he's telling them that life on this earth without, without worshiping, well, let's put it this way. Life on this earth, here, the theme, this is the theme of Ecclesiastes. Life on this earth without seeking the Lord, without serving the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Life on this earth without the grace of God, without Christ, essentially, is worthless, ultimately worthless. <clears throat> now, I know <clears throat> that as people go through life, they can do things that affect others for years and years down the road, and we wouldn't consider that worthless. But what Solomon is doing is he's putting things in the perspective of eternity, eternal value. And what it is, he's showing my friend, this world is not going to last forever. And God has appointed a time for everything. You remember in Ecclesiastes 3, to everything there is a season and a purpose, a time for everything under heaven. 
That's God's sovereign providence. God is absolutely sovereign in all things. God created this world. <clears throat> He's the ruler. He's the governor. He's the sovereign of this world, of the whole universe. And He works all things after the counsel of His own will. And until God brings a sinner to recognize this and to seek the Lord and to worship Him and follow Him, it really, in the scheme of eternity, is all worthless. And Solomon goes through a, through a whole realm of, a whole plethora, rather, of different things, man's work, man's play, all this thing. You know, he says, there's nothing wrong with us working and enjoying the fruits of our labors as long as we thank God, seek God, and we thank Him and seek Him through Christ. And so now in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, he starts, he, he concludes this book by saying, verse 1, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. It's good for a person to, to seek the Lord, worship the Lord, serve the Lord when he's young, when she's young. Because he says, and he uses metaphorical language to describe old age from there. And then he comes to this Verse 8, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And he says in verse 9, listen to this. And moreover, moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Now that's what a wise preacher does. He teaches people knowledge. And where are we going to find that knowledge? From the Word of God. That's what I do. I preach the Word of God. I don't preach my own Word or dreams or visions or uh, opinions that I have. I want to tell you what God's Word says because that's the knowledge you need. That's the knowledge I need. Christ said in His high priestly prayer in John 17, I believe it's verse 3, He says, This is life eternal that they may know Thee, the true and living God, and Jesus Christ whom Thou hast sent. How am I going to know God? Through Jesus Christ, who is the God-man, who, who is the Redeemer of His people, who died on the cross to save His people from their sins. And so He taught the people knowledge. Verse 9, yea, He gave good heed. In other words, He not only taught them knowledge, but He, he took stock in it. He, he followed it, and He says, and sought out and set in order many proverbs. And you know, Solomon is, is attributed, a lot of the Proverbs in the book of Proverbs are attributed to Solomon too. Verse 10, the preacher sought to find out acceptable words, appropriate words. You may have a concordance there. It says words of delight. But now, the Word of God, the words of God, are only a delight to the people of God. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. And then he says in verse 10, And that which was written, that was upright, even words of truth. Verse 11, The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by, by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. The words of God do many things for God's people. They convict us. They encourage us. They teach us. They comfort us. All of those things. They guide us, and he says, like nails fastened by the masters of assemblies which are given from one shepherd, and the one shepherd is Christ. He is the good shepherd. He is the chief shepherd. He is the great shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And so that's Christ. And so the only way we're really going to understand and know the Word of God in salvation, from Genesis to Revelation is to see Christ in the Scriptures. So he says in verse 12, And further, by these my son be admonished, be corrected, of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. And what he's talking about there is the books of men. You go into the bookstores today, even the religious bookstores, and, and mainly what you see is a self-help uh, kind of thing. Here's how you can help yourself. It's not studies of God's Word. and uh, It's always something that, that takes you away from God. 
So here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Now look at verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. When we consider the whole of life, when we consider everything that we do or don't do, everything we build, everything we, we act upon, everything we set our time to and our attention, here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Now, what's following is something very important. And here's what he starts off with. He says, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Fear God. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means to respect God. It means to reverence God. It means to seek God as God reveals himself in his word. That's what it means. It means to believe God. That's what fear God is. It means to worship God. It means to serve God. Not out of legal fear. You know, there is a legal fear. You know, legal fear is natural to even unbelievers. It's natural to all of us. Legal fear is the kind of fear that motivates you to worship and serve a God as you think He is in order to attain or maintain salvation. Serving God for what you can get out of Him. Legal fear is a fear of loss of reward. I heard a preacher say one time, the reason he preached is because he didn't want to lose his reward. Well, that's legal fear. Legal fear is, is mercenary. It's, it's, it's the kind of person who is a hireling. Legal fear is fear of, of hell. Now, now, any of us should fear to go to hell. But, our motiv but the believer's motivation for serving God is not just to stay out of hell. It's because God has saved that person by His grace. And his motive is grace and love and gratitude, not legalism, not mercenary uh, promise of earned reward. The Bible says in Romans 3.18 that by nature there's no fear of God before our eyes. That's us by nature. So this fear here is, is a godly fear that arises from God-given faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as the surety of my salvation. Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 1 that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And that's what this is all about. Worship God. Seek the Lord. Now how am I going to seek the Lord? Well, you seek the Lord in His Word. Now you, there are things that we can know about God from looking at nature, looking at at uh, Providence. But if you're going to seek the Lord, you need to go to His Word, the Bible. This is God's revelation of Himself. And if you find what it says in the Bible about God, you may come away saying, well, I don't really understand all that. But to fear Him is to say, that's the way it is. That's who God is. How do you know? Because it's in the Bible. That's how God reveals Himself. I mentioned, uh, in, I've mentioned in several messages on this program the doctrine of election. That God chose a people. And, some, and, and a lot of people don't like that today. A lot of them who call themselves Christian, they don't like that. And they concoct a view of God that is not scriptural. They say, well, God looked down through the telescope of time and foresaw who would believe. They make God a crystal ball gazer. And that's not the way the Bible portrays God. A lady told me one time that a friend of hers asked her about this. He, she, he asked her, he said, what do you think about this election thing? And she said she didn't know what to tell him. And I told her what to tell him. What do I think about it? It's in the Bible. That's what God reveals of himself. And if that's what God reveals of himself, then I'm going to fear God and not man. I'm going to believe God. You say, well, I don't understand all that. It doesn't matter. That's what God says of Himself. Now, if you seek God in His Word, 
What are you going to find? You're going to find that God reveals Himself through Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. And let me give you the two, the two things that you need to understand to find the true and living God as He reveals Himself in the Word of God. First of all, you need to know what the Bible says about the person of Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? Well, the Bible says that He is God in human flesh. He is God-man. The Bible reveals God in the, in the three persons of the Godhead. Not three gods. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, I don't understand that. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, a, a concept that's impossible for a human being to get our minds around. But it's the way God reveals Himself, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God in three persons. And that God, through the Son, the second person of the Trinity, reveals the glory of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you want to know God the Father, if you want to know God the Son, if you want to know God the Holy Spirit, who do you go to? Where do you look? You look to Christ, who is God in human flesh. John 1, 14. The Word was made flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us. Matthew 1, 21 says, For His name shall be called Jesus, for He shall save His people from their sins. And then verse 23 says, For His name shall be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Colossians chapter 2, 9 says that in Him, in Christ, dwelleth all, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in Him. If you want to know the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you look to Christ, who He is. He's God in human flesh. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. So therefore, anyone who denies the deity of Christ or the humanity of Christ, they do not fear God. Another way that we, fear, that, that we seek and find and know God is through the work of Christ. And that refers to His work as God-man, as He, the, as the representative, the surety, the, the substitute, the redeemer, and the intercessor of His people, came to this earth. Came, uh, he became incarnate. Isaiah said it. The son was given. The child was born. And he came to this earth made under the law, made of a woman, that's his humanity, made, uh, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. His redemptive work. And it goes to this. What did Jesus Christ op actually accomplish when he died on that cross for the sins of his people. And what the Bible teaches is that he accomplished the complete salvation of all whom the Father had given him before the foundation of the world. Didn't he say in John chapter 6 and verse 37, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. This is the will of him that sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but raise it up again at the last day. Now, most people look at verses like that, and they say, well, that's what God wants to do, but he can't do unless you let him. And that is not the God of the Bible. You don't fear God, if that's what you believe. Christ came to put away the sins of his people by His death on the cross. And let me tell you what He did. He put them away. Our sins, the sins of His people, were imputed, charged to Him. And He died on that cross and satisfied the justice of God in their place. It's called a propitiation. That is, He turned back the wrath of God from them. He took upon Himself the wrath of God for their sins. And in doing that, he established righteousness which God, by which God justifies them. God forgives them their sins. God will not charge them with sins. And God declares them righteous in his sight. And they must be saved. They must be born again. That righteousness that Christ worked out on the cross is the ground of their justification 
but it's also the source and power of their new birth, regeneration and conversion. So all for whom Christ died will be born again. They will be brought to faith in Christ. And go back to Ecclesiastes 12, uh, verse 13. He says, fear God. And then he says, keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Now, whenever we see the term keep his commandments, you know, Christ himself, he said that his people keep his commandments. Well, what are his commandments? Well, most people go to the Ten Commandments. But when it comes to a right relationship with God, it is not based upon the keeping of, of the Ten Commandments. Now, we should all seek to obey God. We should all seek to be moral people. When it, the, the summation of all the commandments of God is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, spirit. Love your neighbor as yourself. We should all strive to do that. But we also have to understand that we are sinners. And as sinners, we, we cannot keep the law perfectly so as to earn or attain or maintain salvation. Salvation is not by deeds of law. It's not by our works. It's by the grace of God. And the grace of God... You know what most people think of the grace of God today? They think of grace as you do your part and God will do His or God will fill in the blanks. You do what you can do. And where you fall short, God will fill in the blanks with Christ. Or so. That is not grace. Romans 5.21 says that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness. All right, now righteousness is perfection, the perfection of the law. Gra even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Salvation is based not on my law keeping. It's based upon Christ's law keeping for Christ, Romans 10, 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You see that? Grace is God's righteousness at Christ's expense. And all who come to faith are brought to faith by the Holy Spirit. All who are brought to fear God, they believe in Christ. They rest in Christ. They trust Christ. They submit to His righteousness as their only righteousness before God. And so when he says keep His commandments, what is, what is he talking about? He's talking about believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel command. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. He's talking about repenting of our dead works. Repent. Except you repent, you'll perish. And what am I to repent of? Yes, I'm to repent of my sins, but I'm also to repent of those things which I thought were good. When, but when I thought they recommended me unto God, I found out they were evil. One old preacher said that, that, that believers are they're brought by God to repent of their sins, S-I-N-S, and they're brought to repent of their sin, what they are by nature, and then they're brought to repent of their own righteousness. Like the Pharisee and the publican, the Pharisee thought he was righteous. Well, he's commanded to repent of that. <coughs> and then, yes, we're commanded to be obedient to God, to follow Christ, to imitate Him. Not in order to be saved, not in order to earn our, our, uh, our rewards, not in order to keep ourselves saved, and not, a, not in order to attain assurance. We're commanded to obey Him with the obedience of grace, love, and gratitude from faith, knowing that Christ, Christ is the only merit I have before God. Christ is my only assurance, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. And so when He says, this is the whole duty of man, Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. He's talking about believing in, trusting, resting in, following the Lord Jesus Christ as He is revealed, identified, and distinguished 
in this Word, the Word of God. And it shows from Genesis to Revelation, Christ is in every book. He's either there by prophecy, He's there by picture and type and shadow, He's there by explicit testimony, He's described, and, and many times he's spoken of as already having done a work which was to be left to be done in the future because God sees things that are not yet done as though they were. That's his eternal perspective. And Christ is the one and only Savior of sinners. There's none other. If you believe there are many ways to heaven like many people do today, you don't fear God. Because the God of this book, he states out clearly, there is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved than that which we, we have, uh, have testified, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He's the only way of salvation. My friend, without Christ, there's no salvation. Without Christ, there's no forgiveness. Without Christ, there's no righteousness. Without Christ, there's no saving faith. And without Christ, there is no fear of God. That's the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Now, as you read through the Bible, you're going to come upon many things about God that just will boggle your mind. But what do you do? You fear God. You fear God and keep His commandments. You fear God and look to Christ. Rest in Christ. You follow Christ. And that's, that's the whole duty of man. There's nothing else really when it comes to eternity. We have responsibilities in this life and Solomon talks about them all the way through Ecclesiastes. But my friend, this is the whole duty of man. This is the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. I hope you'll join us next week for another message from God's Word. We are glad you could join us for another edition of Reign of Grace. This program is brought to you by Reign of Grace Media Ministries, an outreach ministry of Eager Avenue Grace Church in Albany, Georgia. To receive a copy of today's program or to learn more about Reign of Grace Media Ministries or Eager Avenue Grace Church, write us at 1102 Eager Drive, Albany, Georgia, 31707. Contact us by phone at 229-432-6969 or email us through our website at www.thelettererofgrace.com. Thank you again for listening today and may the Lord be with you.